Hi guys, thanks for tuning in. In this video, I'm going to talk about the Gauss-Green formula. Now, this is a fairly intimidating looking formula from a later chapter in this course, but we're teaching it a little bit early because it turns out that we can use this formula to turn a double integral that we don't really want to compute into a single integral that we do know how to compute. So this formula is very powerful. It's a uh, uses material that we haven't really learned yet, and there's extra letters, extra variables in this formula that we're not really ready for yet. Really, this formula is going to be for vector fields, which we're learning about in the coming weeks and months, but we're not really learning about right now. So you're going to notice there's a lot of pieces here. I've got an m of x of t, y of t, an x prime of t, an n of x of t, y of t, a y prime of t, and then some partial derivatives, dn, dx, and dm, dy. There's a lot going on here. And when we get to the chapter where we start learning about vector fields, we're going to need all the pieces of this equation. But for now, all we really need to notice is, first of all, um, this formula is true. There is a proof of it at the end of my notes for this chapter. Um, but second of all, we notice that this is a way of turning a double integral that perhaps might be difficult to compute into a single integral that maybe might be a little bit easier to compute. That's the main thing that we want to take away from this formula at the moment, moment, that the left side has a double integral and the right side has a single integral. And don't get too lost in all of the letters of the alphabet that are appearing there. Most of this formula, or the rest of this formula, is going to become uh, much easier to understand as we get to later chapters. So for now, just notice double integral turns into single integral. Uh, common mathematical uh, strategy here. Turn a hard problem that I don't know how to do into an easier problem that I do know how to do. Now, uh, when do we want to use the Gauss-Green formula? It's specifically when our region on the xy plane has a boundary curve that's easy to parameterize. So look at the picture that's on the screen here. Um, I've got a surface that's floating over the xy plane, and I want to compute a double integral over, it looks like a, you know, kind of a circular region here, right? This looks like a disk. Well, what's special about this curve is it's a, this boundary curve can be parameterized. I can write an x of t, y of t, that traverses the boundary of this region, and that's specifically what the Gauss-Green formula is going to be useful for in, in this chapter. Um, we've talked about how to double integrate over a rectangular region. We've talked about how to double integrate over, we had like a parabola, right? Um, a curve, a region that had a top bounding curve and a bottom bounding curve. So this last technique is for how to handle a situation where our curve on the xy plane, it's not a rectangle. It doesn't have a top and a bottom that's easy to easy to separate. Instead, it's something that's easy to parameterize as some x of t y of t. That's specifically what we're going to be using the Gauss-Green formula for. Now there are some rules about our x of t, y of t. So when you parameterize your boundary curve on the xy plane, uh, your boundary curve should be parameterized in the counterclockwise direction. The Gauss-Green formula expects a counterclockwise parameterization, so we need to give it what it's expecting. Um, our t low and our t high are bounds for our parameter need to bring us around our boundary curve exactly one time. Um, if you aren't careful and I mean, let's say you accidentally let t vary from 0 to 4 pi, but that brings you around your curve twice, you're going to get double the answer you're expecting. So you need to make sure that you are limiting your bounds, your limits of integration, to one trip around your boundary curve. Um, it'll often be 0 to 2 pi, but there are cases where it is not 0 to 2 pi, so you do have to kind of tune in and be careful there. And then finally, we do have the rule that our boundary curve on the xy plane be a simple closed curve. Um, closed is easy to understand, means that the curve connects with itself. And then simple means that I don't want any funny behavior, such as little loop-de-loops or anything because uh, that'll mess up our direction of parameterization. Remember, it says that our parameterization has to be counterclockwise, but if we allow self-intersections on our curve, we could end up in a funny situation where part of our boundary curve 
has a counterclockwise parameterization as required, and then part of it has a clockwise parameterization. So we want to avoid things like self-intersections. That's what we, that's mostly what we mean when we say a simple closed curve. We do not want self-intersections. We want a closed curve that we are able to um, parameterize in a consistently counterclockwise direction. Uh, by the way, if you do want to go online and look up this formula from other sources, uh, this U of I course does call this the Gauss-Green formula, but I will say that uh, depending on the textbook or the source you're looking at, Gauss-Green theorem is a fairly popular name and Green's theorem is a popular name. So um, three different names for the exact same mathematics. So if you look it up on Wikipedia or something, uh, don't think that, oh, this is Green's theorem, it must be something different. No, same thing. Gauss-Green formula, Gauss-Green theorem, Green's theorem, same thing. All right, so let's try crunching the numbers on a concrete example here. So uh, at the beginning, this looks very similar to a problem that we would have done on one of our previous videos. We have a surface, f of xy is equal to, in this case, it's y minus xy plus 9. So this is some surface living in three-dimensional space. And I want to compute the double integral of f of xy over the region described by this ellipse. Now, in this case, my surface is above the xy plane um, over this entire region. So this is actually going to be a volume calculation. It's going to be the volume trapped between this surface, f of xy, and our elliptical region on the xy plane. Now, we spent a, a lot of time learning how to parameterize things like ellipses. You guys know this like the back of your hand. You could find an x of t, y of t, describing the um, traversing this boundary curve. And you don't even have to think very hard because you guys have gotten so good at this. And we just saw on the previous slide that um, when we're able to parameterize our boundary curve, that's an indication that we're going to be using the Gauss-Green theorem or the Gauss-Green formula. So let me write out this formula. Again, this formula should look weird and it should look like a very long formula that you don't understand all of the pieces yet. You will understand the pieces in, in the coming chapters, so don't worry too much about that. Um, our goal here is just to put this theorem from a later chapter to work for us now so that we could turn our double integral into an, a much easier to compute single integral. All right, so the first step is to make sure that we know how to parameterize our boundary curve, but as I was saying, you guys know how to take x over 3 squared plus y over 4 squared equals 1 and parameterize it. It's just 3 cosine t comma 4 sine t, where t varies from 0 to 2 pi. Now, if you recall, I've been kind of picky in this course about you listing the, um, listing the range for your parameter. And it might have seemed like I was being picky just for the sake of it, but I wasn't. It turns out that knowing the range for your parameterization turns into the limits of integration for your integral. So every time it seemed like I was being picky on the bounds for your parameter, it was actually getting you ready for the limits of integration on the integrals that I knew you were going to be computing in a couple weeks. So now we're at that point. All right, so here's where the recipe comes in, and this is where you need, need a little bit of, uh, you need to trust me here or kind of give me a little suspension of disbelief. Um, this formula has a lot of pieces to it. It has more pieces than we need. Um, we're just trying to do the double integral of f. But this formula is for the double integral of dn dx minus dm dy. Uh, there's more inside this integrand than I need. Um, if I can kind of stuff f into this formula, then I'm in pretty good shape. But I don't need dn dx minus dm dy. I don't need this entire expression to successfully stuff f into this integrand. So I'm going to let m equals 0. I'm allowed to do that because this formula will work for no matter what you plug into it, right? So, so if I plug m equals 0 into this formula, it's still going to work. So this becomes 0. Well, um, if m is 0, dm dy is 0. So I'm zeroing out a big chunk of this formula. Why? Because I can. I don't need the entire formula here. So I'm, I'm zeroing out the m, I'm letting m equal 0. And then I'm going to say, OK, well, now how do I stuff f into this double integral of dn dx minus 0? OK, well, the 0 part I can ignore now. But I need to somehow 
turn d n dx into f, because that's how I can get f into this into this formula. Well, okay, set f equal to d n dx. Well, we know some calculus at this point. We know that if f is equal to d n dx, then I can integrate both sides, and I get that n is equal to the integral from 0 to x of f of s y ds. Notice that I've put a placeholder variable in there. So this x, I'm putting in an s and a ds, and my x is now living in that upper limit of integration. So my x didn't go away, I just put it into the upper limit of integration there, and I put a placeholder variable inside of my single integral. Uh, now this is a cookie cutter recipe, so once you've seen this one time, every time you see a problem like this, it's going to work out pretty much the same way. Now, um, I know the equation for f. It's up here at the top of the screen. I have uh, x minus uh, x or y minus xy plus 9. So I'm going to plug that into my integrand here. Now, re remember that I am replacing every instance of x with s. So I have y minus sy plus 9 ds. Now we can compute the antiderivative with respect to s. The antiderivative of y with respect to s is sy. Um, the antiderivative of negative sy with respect to s is negative s squared y over 2. And the antiderivative of 9 with respect to s is 9s. Now I'm going to plug in s equals x and s equals 0. Really, I should have written it as s equals x and s equals 0 here, just that there wasn't any confusion about which variable I'm plugging in for. But I get xy minus x squared y over 2 plus 9x. Now, uh, you'll notice I'm kind of color coding things here. I'm trying to line up the things that we're computing with the gauss green formula so that you can see where everything is going to eventually be plugged in. m is going to be 0. Um, I have n of x, y here. I need to now just write that as n of x of t, y of t, because the formula doesn't ask for n of x, y. It asks for n of x of t, y of t. So I'm going to replace all instances of x with x of t. And I'm going to replace all instances of y with y of t. And we know what our x of t and our y of t are, because we figured that out ourselves. That's the parameter parameterization of this boundary curve here. It's 3 cosine t comma 4 sine of t. So you plug that all in, and it is kind of a mess. And then I also need my x prime of t and my y prime of t. That's just my tangent vector for my, for my boundary curve here. So I'm going to take my 3 cosine t comma 4 sine t, and take the derivative. I have negative 3 sine of t comma 4 cosine of t. I've got all of the pieces here. I have everything I need. If you compare colors between the Gauss Green formula and everything that's on the screen, I have all of the necessary pieces that I need to plug in. So I have managed to turn a double integral that would be difficult to compute, and I've managed to turn it into a single integral that's much easier to compute. So I'm going to plug in all of these puzzle pieces, all of these color-coded puzzle pieces. And just to make sure it's all summarized, I put it here in a table. So m of x of t, y of t is 0. Here's n of x of t, y of t. Here's my t low to t high, my limits of integration. And here's my x prime of t and my y prime of t. Plug in all of those pieces. What's really nice here is at the beginning, 0 times x prime of t. That we don't actually need that at all because that zeroes out. And if I distribute this 4 cosine of t, into my n of x of t, y of t, I have turned a difficult double integral into a much simpler single integral. Now, I'm not saying this problem is necessarily easy in the sense that you need to remember how to use some u substitution. I have u sub here, some u sub here, and then this uh, requires, requires us to know what cosine squared is. I need that power reducing formula. I'll give that to you guys there for free. And it would be up to you guys now to do the number crunching. Remember, there's going to be a worksheet where you get to verify all of these calculations in my PowerPoint. And that's going to come out to 108 pi. So the volume that's trapped between our surface and our elliptical region on the xy plane is 108 pi. 
Now, like I said, this is a cookie cutter recipe. So we start with a formula that we don't understand super well yet, but we will soon. Then we substitute into that formula. Now, I'm choosing to make m equal to zero. Every year I will get you know, a couple students raising their hand and saying, wait, Mr. Grattoni, why are we plugging in m equals zero? Um, why didn't you make n equals zero? And the answer is you could. Um, this formula has two pieces inside of it but we're just trying to compute the double integral of f. And so if we could find a way to stuff f into this formula, we're in good shape. So one way of doing it is making m equal to zero, and that'll work. Um, but the other question I get is, could you make n equal to zero? And the answer is yes. And in fact, you guys are gonna do it on a try it problem. Um, and you'll even see another variation on it um, that'll, come, you know, that'll involve taking the average of those two different methods and seeing what you get. You'll see it on the homework, pretty cool problem here. But Long story short, this is a recipe that's going to work out for you pretty much every time as long as you can parameterize your boundary curve as an x of t, y of t, and as long as um, you make sure that your t low to t high takes you around exactly one loop of your boundary curve, and as long as you have a simple closed curve. This is going to work out pretty nicely. Um, when you do the number crunching, you are going to probably need some trig identities because our x of t, y of t is typically going to be you know, a circle or an ellipse or something involving trig functions. Um, so don't forget your trig identities, don't forget your use substitution techniques when you're trying these problems. Now, um, when should you use which technique? So Gauss Green, what I just showed you guys, is really good for regions that can be parameterized and as an x of t, y of t. Um, double integrals over a non-rectangular region, uh, the technique from my previous video, uh, you have to pick between a dy dx integral and a dx dy integral in those cases. If you have a left bounding curve and a right bounding curve, you would want a dx dy integral. If you have a, an easily defined top bounding curve and bottom bounding curve, you would want a dy dx integral. And then again, like I said, if you are able to parameterize the boundary of your region on the xy plane, then you would try the Gauss Green theorem. All right, guys, I hope this video was helpful. Um, that should help you with uh, some, of your, some of your work on the triad problems that you're going to be completing soon. And if you are interested, I do have a proof of the Gauss-Green theorem that I wrote. Uh, this is available on my website uh, in my notes, and you can run through these steps. Um, I'm not going to do it now because I think uh, you guys probably want to get started on the homework. But I know that uh, sometimes students think, well, I really want to know why this formula is true. I can do that for you. Just check out this proof. It's got all of the steps, and I'm happy to answer any questions um, about the steps, the algebraic or the graphical steps that go into this proof. All right, guys, thanks again for tuning in, and have a great day.